All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for watching. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a pastor's talk with all of the pastors and uh, it was well received. People enjoyed it. We heard a lot of feedback about it. And so we wanted to bring you something else. And um, over this time of unprecedented change and leading in change, one of the things that seemed to be relevant right now is um, talking with Pastor Kivett about leading in change. Uh, Kivett, why don't you share a little bit about just how long you've been senior pastor and give a little background there. So uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's really good to be able to, um, to do this, just to share for just a little bit and not in any way, shape or form do I think or act like, I hope anyway, that I've got all the answers in leading and change, but uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity just to just spend some time talking about this stuff here for just a few minutes. Uh, so I've, I've been pastor for Salem now for three and a half years. It was September of 2016 that the church called me to be their pastor. Uh, I am thankful for the time before that where we had the opportunity to, um, I was the youth pastor at, at Salem and uh, for that time of building relationships. But so all total, uh, next month, it will have been six years ago that Hillary and I moved from Lynchburg, Virginia down to Winston-Salem to come to Salem and uh, it's been some great years but it's also been some some tough years sometimes because uh, I think naturally with with the with changes in leadership there's there's changes in um, in, in passions and sometimes changes in focus for a church or an, or, or an organization and uh, you know I Dr. Wilburn was the pastor before me and and he is um, he was about uh, 30 five plus years older than I was. And uh, I think I'm probably the youngest pastor since the 1920s for Salem. I was 29 when, when the church called me to be pastor. And, you know, I first time being a senior pastor messed up many, many, many times over the last several years, but with those mess ups probably come more stronger uh, lessons learned than, than anything else. Um, than the, than the victories, I should say. Uh, but I think in this in this last three and a half years, there's been the opportunity to uh, to love people and and be loved by people, and that makes difficult times or or change easier to adapt to and kind of walk through. Um, you know, I one of the things that um, you know, as, as I think about change in general for the last couple of years, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is uh, <clears throat> music. We, we've, we've changed the music style of our church. And man, that is a touchy subject because where we got one person who is itching for change and itching for us to just move forward in, in some ways with that. You've got some other folks who are adamant that what we have currently or what we had was... Um, was much better than anything that they're that they're hearing right now, and I find that there's very few people who are right in the middle who are you know what I care less. There are some of those, but um, but that's that's been a difficult change to walk through, and a lot of one on one and, and personal conversations um, have taken place with that one. You know, we we've we've made some some changes in schedule with our church. We've we've, we've worked to adapt from being what. what I would consider analog to digital when it comes to technology. Um, analog is, you know, uh, uh, Harper, you've got a uh, analog clock behind you, and it's obviously still uh, <laughs> not the correct time. <laughs> I need to buy you a battery for that thing. <laughs> um, but but anyway, the, you know, the difference between analog and, and digital. Oftentimes, analog. We try to be analog in a digital world, and those two worlds collide. And, and when they do collide, oftentimes they don't collide well. <laughs> and so we've, we've had to work through a, um, an accepting of, of living in a digital world. Um, we're seeing that now, even with the COVID-19 quarantine that's taken place. So um, that's just a couple examples of, of change. And, and I'm <laughs> sure that there's others with a complete list of, of all the changes made in the last several years. Um, and, and maybe they're thinking of, of things that, that I don't, but that's just a couple examples in this, in this moment. Yeah, that's, that's great. Cause as I've thought about um, leading and change right now, um, 
there's some changes that we plan out and we know we're going to be leading in. And then in this instance, this is a change that we had ever assumed we would be leading in. And so, uh, so you kind of gave us some examples of uh, change you've already led in, uh, even some significant change over the nearly four years of being senior pastor at Salem. Um, and so part of this for the people is kind of unpacking that, helping people see um, some of the background uh, behind the scenes, giving them a peek behind the curtain at some of what they may not know goes into leading and change, some of the difficulties, the challenges, but also some of your experience of what you've seen and even been led in change by other people, uh, whether that's growing up in a family or at college or in a previous job at a larger Christian organization. Um, and so why don't you share a little bit about, you know, I don't know if there, you think back to some experiences in your life prior to being at Salem, uh, wherever that might be, where you were led in change and some of your memories, some of your takeaways from that and how that kind of has impacted your leadership. Yeah, there's several things I can think of just right off the bat. Um, one was my family and I were a part of the same church for, for years. I mean, I, I grew up in this church and uh, there was some difficulties that took place there and some, some, uh, just some obvious, uh, reasons that it was time for us to, to move on from that church. And, and we went from one setting that, that we were completely used to that, um, did not bump comfort zones really at all when it comes to anything from music to preaching, all of that stuff. And, and, and in, in looking for another church for my family to go to, uh, there's really in our area of Southern Davidson County, where there's not much in general, there was really one obvious choice because there's so many uh, churches who were preaching and, and and yes, they were doing a good job. Um, there was one church that was growing through salvation growth and they were reaching people and my family wanted to be a part of that church. And it, it even, it even crossed denominational lines to, to, to go and, and be a part of that. And even though they didn't fully understand or, or agree with everything that, that this church taught when it came to, to doctrine, um, that was one of the, the first times that I was ever faced with, with church, with major church change. Um, mm -hmm. But it taught me a lot. And it taught me that, that my perspective and, and my, uh, the way I look at things is not always the right thing. I, I'll never forget walking into the church within the first couple of weeks and, and going to the youth group. I was 17. I was a, I was a senior in high school. Um, and, uh, and walking into the youth group and thinking, I have never in my life seen any youth group like this, but it was, it was awesome because, um, yeah, it was different. And, and yeah, the music was different. And yeah, there was, there was a lot of, um, just craziness, insanity. Um, and it was different from anything that I had experienced. However, it was very normal for them. Um, but it was normal in such a way that people were being reached and disciples were being made. And, 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 and that helped me realize, okay, the main thing here for them is, is not the games they play. It's not the music they play. It's, it's not the, even the, the way they go about, you know, the, the teaching or anything like that. The main thing for them, the, the big picture is reaching kids for Christ. And, and they were doing it and they were doing it very well. So that helped me realize, you know what, um, change is a good thing when the heart behind the change and the reason for the change is, um, it has eternity in mind. Um, now there's, there's reasons that, that organizations change and they have need to change with the times that they live in, but behind the change should always be something that's bigger, something bigger, some kind of bigger purpose. And um, so that was, that's one experience I can think of. I, I also, um, <clears throat> man, I, I think about, um, you know, just, working for Liberty University after graduation. Um, I, I started off working in what was called student care office. And, and that was a counseling office for, for students. Uh, I was the office manager. Um, started off with a few employees who worked directly for me. And then by the time I left that office a couple of years into it, uh, there was about, um, about 50 some employees that, that worked for me and they were all students. Um, so it was it was fantastic to to be able to lead them. But uh, the the supervisor that we had, the dean of students, was a man who thrived on moving forward and thrived on here's here's what we need to do to be better to um, to minister well. And so 
there was constant change that took place with that. Um, <clears throat> so learning to not only be led in change in that time, but also to lead in change was, was something that I had to do. Then I went on a little bit later to work in the housing office at, at Liberty, and I didn't have as many employees um, at that point, but uh, there were still some. And uh, that was that was more, I think God put me there for experience in everything from maintenance to contracts to budgets and things that I would use later on that I, at the time I didn't really understand. Okay, um, God, why are you doing this? I appreciate the pay raise, but, um, but you know, uh, that, was, that was something that God put into my life to teach me. So... That's a couple of things. Uh, moving from Lynchburg to, to Winston-Salem was, was a major change because we were heavily involved in a church that was very different from Salem when we were there in, um, in Lynchburg. And then coming into the Salem setting uh, was, was somewhat hard. Uh, we, we believed with all our hearts that God had led us to Salem and we were thankful to be there, but it was, it was just different. We had to learn to adapt to that change. So that's that's a few examples of what you're asking for there. I think. Yeah, no, that's 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 good. Thanks for thanks for sharing this. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you've you've got you've had that experience of, you know, being led in change and even like you sh shared leading in change early on before even being at Salem. And um, so obviously, after leading in change and coming through the other side victorious, um, it's obvious then that everything was worth the work and the hardship, even the discouragement kind of along the way. Um, but in the midst of it, and even at the beginning stages of it, it's not always evident that it's going to be worth it. You don't always know yeah. it's going to come through victorious. And so, uh, so kind of give us a peek behind the curtain here. Yeah, that, that'd be, that'd be great. That, I, I, um, I, you know, a lot of times I think people, um, people think, that changes is something that just just happens, and 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 sometimes that's the case. We're we're in the middle of COVID nineteen. There's nothing we could do about about this. We had to adapt to the forced change that, that is around us. Um, but other times, there is a lot that's going on behind the scenes that that is not seen. Um, so so from my experience here at, at Salem. Uh, I can point back to about six different phases or six different time periods of, of my ministry as senior pastor. And, and each one of those major time periods has been led by at least three to six months of God doing a work in my heart um, of, of molding and shaping me and of, of redirecting my mind, redirecting my, my thought processes, my uh, even the way I approach quiet times, the way that I approach God's word and, and prayer. Uh, for every one of those major phases, there's been that three to six month time period where it's just me. It's, it's just God molding and shaping in, in me what he wants done. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples. One is uh, there was a time period, and I can't remember the exact months there, but I, I believe it was November of 2017. I think that's right. Uh, that God really placed a burden on my heart for purity in the church. Okay, and there was there was no there was there was no overwhelming reason to be praying for this. It was just all of a sudden it's like God just put this on my heart, and I spent three months just praying. God, show us the ways in which you're not being honored in our church, and um, show us the ways in which there may be some sin that's there. And um, and, and first of all, do that in me. And so I had three months of praying, God showed me the sin in my heart. So then I think if I remember correctly, this time frame, it was about February of 2018, where all of a sudden there's just a couple of things that come up and, and it was hidden sin in, in people's lives that, that had been there for some time. And all of a sudden God starts bringing it up to them and they come to me and they say, hey, this is some sin that I've got in my life. And, and all of a sudden I see God purifying his church. Um, and and that's a that's a subtle change. It's it's behind the scenes. People don't necessarily see that. But but where I've already I've spent three months praying through this. All of a sudden now we're in this phase where I think it lasted about three months. There was there was no less than twelve to fifteen people or families that came to me and said, "Hey, we've got this in our life that that we just need help with." And it just it, it 
and it's not ne- not necessarily something that I can get up and, and and talk about in front of the church, but it's a way that I see God working, and 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 it's a way that He is changing our church, and He is changing the heart of our church in that way. So, so that's that's one example of a way that I've seen God work. Um, you, you know, music is another thing that you know we we, we go back to that, but. Music is is constantly adapting, is constantly constantly changing in our culture, and it has for the last couple thousand years. Um, it's going to continue to change, even in the next however many days we've got left on this earth. And I think that we're coming to a close before too long. Just my opinion. Um, but it's something that that we should constantly be growing in when it comes to music. And so for six months, and, and I can tell you. Right about the time I've got this written down, right about the time where um, God started working on my heart about music in the church and praying, okay, who's the right person to to be a part of this and to lead us in this in the future? And there were some tough, tough decisions that needed to be made and just some tough conversations. Um, but uh, but then we come out of it and you don't feel completely victorious um, because you know it's a, it's a hard fought, uh, not battle, but but just trying to wrestle with through this, you know, um, and, uh, but that's something that God had been doing in my life for, for months, working on me f- for months before it's ever spoken about to anybody else. And, um, and that's one of the great things about how our God works and how the Holy spirit works in the life of a leader. He molds and shapes the leader, and then he works to mold and shape the, the, the followers. And that's a responsibility that I take very seriously. And it's not something I take lightly in any way. So behind the scenes, oftentimes with change is, is part of your question there. Uh, we, you know, the, it, God starts working in my life, or maybe he uses a Harper, or maybe he uses a Rick, or maybe he uses a VW Peters as chair of the deacons, or somebody else in our church. Um, and, and if something is brought up, and it's, you know, we need to think about this, or we need to talk about this, and, um, and there's the, the maturing time. Um, it's rare that there's something mentioned where we can make a decision just like that. Um, it happens sometimes where it's just absolute common sense. And we like to say common sense is, is common to all, but it's, it's, it's not. But, but to the groups that are involved in making the decisions, it's, you just know this is the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, most of the time, there is at least weeks of working through and, and trying to figure out, okay, what is the right decision here? How do we move forward well? And, and, and how do we do this lead and change well? Um, so it's... it's it's rarely a split second decision. Most of the time, it's a whole lot more, uh, you know, we need to wrestle with this for a little while. Well, and even as you share that, I think, you know, we're going through Nehemiah and you shared about how Nehemiah, he didn't tell anybody what was on his heart, what God had placed on his heart. He he waited months. He prayed about it. Um, and then he moved forward and he was prepared. And you've talked before about tactical patience um, and that idea of in me, the waiting. Yeah, let me... Oh, yeah, go ahead. You define it for us. No, no, no. You would you, you, you be better at defining that, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I think I want to hear you define it. Go ahead. Let's hear it. <laughs> I was going to say, in the waiting, you're working and you're preparing so that when God does lead, you've, you've got the answers. When the king asks you what you need, you have the list of supplies. You have the... Um, everything that's needed and you're, you're ready, prepared with an answer instead of, Oh, okay, well, let me get things together now that we're ready to go. Um, and yeah, so we see that in Nehemiah, even as we're talking through that. So as you mentioned, you've got other leaders and people that you seek out for, for insight and wisdom, obviously. And, um, and each of these kind of areas of change are different and unique in and of themselves. Uh, But through your experience uh, that has been learned through whether it's education or uh, even just through, you know, being led in change and also leading in change, are there any kind of methods, uh, systems, processes that you have learned to kind of put in place and work through as a kind of a template or a blueprint for how to lead and change? Obviously, it isn't just a magic bullet but it helps guide you systematically as you lead and change. Uh, I would say, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things that just a couple of processes and, and methods. Um, the first, the first thing is, you know, one of the things we see in Nehemiah is 
he's got dedicated times of prayer, but then he's also got these popcorn prayers, these these um, mm-hmm. emergency prayers that that go up. And, and I think about Tom Rainer early on. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, I think it was it was probably his book, Who Moved My Pulpit. Is the name of it. Uh, it's a short short read, but it was hugely impactful. And there's one section in there that I remember highlighting, and and I actually pulled up the quote uh, just so I could remember and 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 not butcher it, but. He makes the comment, prayer is not optional in leading change in the church. Uh, it is foundational. And then he makes the comment, he says, you are not smart enough to lead change. Uh, so you need to pray for wisdom. He says, you're not brave enough to lead, to lead change. Uh, you need to pray for courage. He says, you're not strong enough to lead change. So you need to pray for strength. Um, you're not smart enough. You're not brave enough. You're not strong enough. And he is absolutely right because there's there's no point at which I think, you know what, I'm a strong enough leader to where I can lead through this um, with no problems at all. And that's exactly where I mess up over and over again. And it's, it's inevitable. And so, you know, even in, in times of big decision, one of the first things we do is, is we go to the Lord in prayer together as, as pastors, um, as deacons, if it's the deacons that are involved there. Uh, so, so number one, there's, there's the prayer. Uh, number two, and whether that's that's prayer, just me at the time or other people were involved, it, it always, always begins with and should end with prayer. Uh, but then secondly, one of the things that, that I do is, is wrestle through, OK, well, what is what does this mean? The, the bigger picture, um, the, the mission that Jesus has given us is to make disciples and, and in making disciples. It's not just. Uh, taking Christians who are already believers and making them stronger disciples. No, it's uh, the goal here is for a disciple to make a disciple. And so how do we how do we make sure that we're fulfilling the mission that Jesus has given us? And is, does this change that we're thinking about, uh, does it apply to that? And does it speak to that? Uh, will it will it build that mission up or will it detract from the mission? Now for, for our church, we got the mission statement of finding and pursuing life in Jesus. And that's one of the ways we've been able to to, to just put in a, in a short statement what we believe that making disciples looks like. It's finding um, the life that comes in Jesus. Um, but then it's also, even after finding, it's pursuing, the, continually pursuing the life that is found in Jesus. So um, there's, it's kind of running it through that, that filter of, of, does this add to that or does it distract from it? Um, but then there's the, the gathering around of, of other people. So uh, I can't remember who it was, I heard refer to this as a holy huddle. It's 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 people who are godly. It's people who um, you you trust. They're on your team. They they know that you um, they know your heart. They know your downfalls. They know oftentimes your the ways in which you just have the dumbest ideas that could ever come about. Um, and they can speak truth into the situation. You know, they're the ones who can say, "Kivit, that's that's um, that's an awesome idea, or that's something that we need to pray about." Or they say, "Kivit, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life." So there's that holy huddle that, that kind of comes next. And then, then from there, it's, it's you gather people around you who, um, who not only speak truth into your life, but can be that support. And they can say, you know, I may not be able to speak to this, but I can pray for you in this. And I, I, you have support. And um, all along, it's running through filters all throughout. And if any po- at any point it doesn't pass the, um, pass the filter test, then, then you scrap it and you, you you, or at least adapt it. Um, one of the hardest things for me is is actually um, following through after presenting a um, a change, um, following through over the next couple of weeks because there's so much work that's gone in before the church as a whole ever even hears about, or the the school or the camp uh, before they ever even hear about. The change itself. There's so much work that's taking place, and all of a sudden you get to that mountaintop or that 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 experience of, of okay, here's the vision, here's sharing what it would look like. Um, all I want to do then is go and, and rest, you know, <laughs> and remove myself from it completely for a little bit because I'm just tired, you know. But then that's where one of the most important times comes in of of having people around you who are able to speak to it and and come alongside and say, for the person who has questions say, here's the answers to your questions. And um, mm-hmm. I, I, 
when questions come in, oftentimes after a big moment of maybe it's a Sunday morning of sharing, hey, here's where I believe that God's taking us, or here's what I believe should happen. And I, I should have member meeting, church service, meeting, whatever it is. Um, and I get questions. There's many times that I forward those questions and not always the person who asked them, but before those questions say, hey guys, would you help me answer these questions? Because I'm just I'm mentally exhausted and I'm tired and need a little bit of a breather for a few days. But then one of the greatest parts is actually seeing those things come to fruition and seeing God work. And, and uh, you know, we made the decision to hire Nate uh, Sexton as our worship pastor. And he came on the team back in August and, you know, we're in, we're in, uh, what are we in April? It's kind of hard. I, don't, I, I not only don't know what day it is of the week it is right now with this quarantine, but I don't know what month we're in. Uh, anyway, I, uh, uh, you know, we're in April and, um, and, and we're seeing the benefits of, of Nate and his family being a part of, of the Salem organization as a whole and specifically our church. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful gift. And, and that's something that I believe God led us through and he walked us through. So, so yeah, that's a nutshell process methods. No, that's, that's good. Um, you know, not everyone, not everyone who's listening is leading a church in change. Uh, most of them are probably a part of a church. Uh, some of them may be leading a business or employees, but many of them may be the ones being led in change. So, but the difference or the, the thing I want to make clear is everyone who's listening is leading at least themselves in change yeah. right now during Absolutely. this time. Some, some are even leading uh, a spouse in change. Uh, some are leading their family in change right now. And uh, again, some are leading a business and employees. Some may be leading a church in change right now. What's, what's kind of one, you know, kind of last thing you want to leave them with about how to lead and change well? I, I would say if you can't lead with integrity and character, then, um, then don't even attempt to be a leader. Uh, because, yeah, you have a responsibility, dads, to lead your family or mom to lead your family, uh, whatever the circumstance may be. And, and uh, maybe for college kids, you've got a responsibility to lead at your job, or maybe you've got a responsibility to lead um, <clears throat> even in a, even it could be a study group that you've got. But if you don't, if you don't do so with integrity and, and character, then it's going to fall down. It's going to break down. And along with that comes the, the responsibility to go to people sometimes and say, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. Um, you know, I, I've had to go to people and say, I'm sorry, just as many times as I've had to go to people and say, um, or, or, or I had the opportunity to go to people and say, hey, let's, let's celebrate this uh, because you're going to mess up. But, but a part of a, a, a person of integrity and a leader of integrity is the ability to know when you've been wrong um, and, uh, and, and to be able to own up, own up to it. Uh, but then for the person who's... You know, not everybody's pastor, like you said, not everybody's a pastor, not everybody's a, a Sunday school teacher, not everybody is someone who's in front of other people, casting vision. Um, a couple of days ago, I was thinking about about this, and um, oftentimes I feel like my responsibility is, is to be the airplane, the, the, the jet at 30,000 foot that kind of keeps an eye on a big picture, because I know that if, if I don't think big picture, then there's nobody else that's going to. But my importance as a as a jet per se at thirty thousand foot is no greater than the um, than the duck at the uh, on on the on the body of water, you know, who, who's a part of the uh, the ecosystem and has a heavy part and 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 carries out a role um, as a part of of the ecosystem. You know, there's um, I, I love. The ability to come down and and to get involved in the dirty and the, the nitty gritty sometimes, but also realize I thrive in the at the thirty thousand foot level. Um, there are some people who are not necessarily they're not in front of people they're not the big leaders like it's like I said, but they are absolutely essential um, to carrying out the work of the Lord and to to advancing the kingdom of God and. Um, they also, if nothing else, if, if, if they are not leading anybody else, they are leading themselves. And one day they're going to give an account for how they lead themselves. Uh, all leaders give an account, will give an account. Um, whether they do it now or as an unbeliever or 
one day they're going to give an account before the Lord if they are a believer for how they led others. And I, I don't take that lightly. We've got um, 90, 90-ish employees all, to, all together across the board, church, camp, and, and school. Um, I take that responsibility of, of leading this organization very seriously, but then um, of leading our church, I take that very seriously because I know I'm going to give an account before the Lord one day. And, and that's that's all of us. So two things. One, lead with the character and integrity or don't lead. Um, two, uh, understand that, that the first person you lead is you. Um, but then beyond that, you're going to give an account for how you lead uh, somewhere in the future. So that's a couple of things that, that come up right away. I think about the Apostle Paul. Let me say this real quick. I think about the Apostle Paul. He would go from one city to the other and he would plant these churches. And and his whole goal was to not be the guy. Um, while he oftentimes was because of his personality, he was out there. He was a strong communicator. Um, he, he was able to develop churches and build churches. Um, his goal in each of those locations is to start a church and then leave that church growing, thriving with strong leaders in it. Uh, That's the same thing that any leader should do. Uh, They don't take it all on themselves and say, I'm going to take care of all this. No, they, yeah, oftentimes their personality is is such that they're the one that's seen the most, but they should be raising up other people to take that church, to take that um, group, to take that whatever it is and see it thrive in the future. That's one of the reasons I've been careful to surround myself with uh, the Dwayne Carsons and the Terry Covingtons and the um, and the Harper Comptons and the Nate Sexton and the Rick Klein. All of those, I'm, I'm sure I missed somebody there, but but people who have the ability to not just lead, but to build leaders and, and to to carry out um, big picture the, the kingdom of God the way He would have us do it. So. I don't even know what your question was, but we, got, we kind of got you off on a, it. on a little bit. Of, okay, good. Got it. Good. Yeah. No, yeah. that's good. I think this has been good. Uh, a lot of times, again, like you said, change is difficult for really everyone if you hit the right nerve or if it's about the right thing. And so, um, so as people see others leading in change, it's difficult to see kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And so I think giving them this look helps them see, okay, this isn't just a, hey, I was up last night and decided we need to change this, this, and this. And all right, let's go for it. This is a process. It takes months. But then also, this isn't where you work in a silo. While there is a time that you process it on your own, you do take it to others. And there is months of preparation beforehand. And um, just kind of seeing, again, behind the scenes of what goes on here. It's not an easy process. And uh, even though it's good change. It doesn't mean it's easy to lead in that change. It's still difficult. There's still discouragement. You just spoke this last week on overcoming discouragement. And so, um, you know, preaching that to ourselves as we lead in change. And and so I think that's good. I hope everyone's benefited from this and being able to see your heart a little more. Um, So thank you for sharing that. Anything you want to leave us with real quick? Yeah, just just briefly. uh, For those people who don't like change, I just want to say that that I hear you and change is hard um, and that that I uh, I'm with you a lot of times. I, I enjoy change just because it gives me a, 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 I'm, Hillary and I were talking last night and, and, and y'all, this is killing me staying home um, being the, this quarantine. It is absolutely killing me because I love to be on the go. I love to see things accomplished, love to see things get done. Uh, my Enneagram tells me that uh, that I should be seeing results. Always, um, and uh, and you know, change is change is tough, but change is a part of life too. And, uh, and if you don't believe me, just go and read about the life of Christ, because the the change that took place, not just in, not in his character, his integrity, not anything like that, but the change that changes that took place in Jesus' life from the time he began his ministry all the way to the end were vast, and a huge number of those. He was going from one place to another, and he was involved with these people, then these people, and he was close with these people. Then all of a sudden, he's got a new, uh, not new, but a different set of close friends who are near him. And so change is a part of life. And but um, and, and but let's uh, let's remember that that we live for the eternal. Um, that that we are to keep our eyes on eternity, and that's the goal. 
uh, that, yeah, this life will bring changes with it. Um, but uh, there is coming a day in which there will be no more change and uh, we won't get bored with the no change. So for those who love change, take it easy. I'm with you. We're going <laughs> to, we'll, we, we always work through this. There's, there's enough change that life brings us to where we don't have to go looking for it. But as the Lord brings it to our, to our doorstep, then we adapt to what he leads us to do. And that goes right along with our plum line. Healthy things grow, growing things change. Is that right? right? That was off the cuff. That's it. You yeah. got it. <laughs> nice job. All right. Well, thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it. Yeah. In the jungle, my jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. <laughs>